When it comes to suspension of disbelief, certain genres obviously have an advantage over others, especially when it comes to petite female characters beating up guys twice their size. When I see the likes of Buffy the Vampire Slayer or Wonder Woman fighting hordes of physically large men, you can kind of buy into it because those characters operate in a fantasy universe and they have supernatural strength. They're more than just human, and the laws of physics of the fictional universes they exist in allow us, the audience, to suspend our disbelief and get on board with what we're seeing. Now, I'm not a fan of Captain Marvel, the character, but I understand she has powers, and although I've spoken about how awful her story arc is and how I don't appreciate the feminist agenda of that movie, nevertheless, I can still buy into the idea, although I'd argue she's massively overpowered. When the media or filmmakers attack male audiences and claim that a film with a strong female character didn't do well because some men are insecure about seeing a woman in an action role, it's obviously ridiculous. And you know that I've previously come up with a list of something like 40 action slash sci-fi movies with women in the primary protagonist lead role. And some of them were very successful indeed. Some of them obviously are able to sell the idea of an ass-kicking tough chick in a more credible way than others, of course. A lot of the times, fans defend their love of strong female characters by referencing people like Ripley from Aliens or Sarah Connor from Terminator 2 Judgment Day. And again, these were just human females with no superpowers. But the general consensus is that in the case of Sarah Connor in Terminator 2, she was kind of an outlier, an exception to the rule, quite masculine in her own way. She'd sacrificed who she was in order to become a soldier and protector to her son. Ripley was also an immensely assertive woman with a massive inner strength and self-reliance. She was also resourceful, making use of a giant exosuit to kill the alien queen at the end of Aliens. Neither character possessed super strength or special powers, but the characters were written and performed in such a way that when they engaged in action sequences, what they did was believable and didn't require an enormous amount of suspension of disbelief on the part of the audience. They weren't ordinary women, and they existed in extraordinary worlds, one being a world of aliens and spaceships, and the other being a world of terminators and time travel. They're also quite masculine in their own way. Similarly, in Aliens, there was the female character of Vasquez, and she also looks really butch and quite believable as a badass female. She's very masculine, and this is one means by which you're sold on the idea that she's very physically imposing and capable. And there was no political agenda here. She was respected by the other male soldiers. She bantered with them. She gave as good as she got. She could mix it with the guys. She had their respect. She respected them. But she didn't need to grind them down or be insulting towards them or belittle them in order to make herself seem stronger, which unfortunately is something that's all too common nowadays in movies that have succumbed to woke and feminism. Vasquez, Sarah Connor, Ripley, I think they were very believable in their own ways. In addition, the writing and the performances assisted greatly. These are not Mary Sue's. They're human beings, they're very flawed, and they're deep characters, and that's why audiences loved them. You look at someone like Sarah Connor in Terminator 2, and I recently rewatched that film, and it gave me more of a perspective on her character, because a lot of people forget who Sarah Connor really was, which is to say who Sarah Connor saw herself as. Yes, she's very tough and masculine for the whole story, but it's an emotionally tough and draining act for her to keep up throughout the film. It doesn't actually come naturally to her. Right, this is evidenced in some dream sequences. Uh, the one with Kyle Reese, for example, she suddenly becomes very feminine again. Right, Her hair is slightly different, for example, and her behavior is much more feminine. This is perhaps the most vulnerable that we see Sarah in the whole movie. She breaks down, she tells him how much she loves him, she needs him, she runs after him. And then in the middle of the movie, she has a dream about the nuclear holocaust, and she sees herself as a feminine, happy, well-adjusted waitress looking after her son in a children's park. And this is how Sarah saw herself underneath, the person she wished she still could be, but had to abandon in order to protect her child because John had no father figure. The original ending saw Sarah return to being a feminine woman, a happy grandmother 
with her granddaughter. This hardcore warrior persona was taxing for Sarah to maintain. She actually has a meltdown when she goes to try to kill Dyson in his home, and John has to bring her back from the brink. Interestingly, she proceeds to lecture Dyson about how men like him created the hydrogen bomb. They don't know what it's like to create life inside a person. Men like you built the hydrogen bomb. Men like you thought it up. You don't know what it's like to really create something, to create a life. To feel it growing inside you. All you know how to create is death. This is in contrast to the Sarah Connor as written in Dark Fate, who belittles motherhood when she says that Danny Ramos is just the Mother Mary figure. Sarah only became a warrior because she had no choice, but underneath the soldier was a feminine woman of grace, beauty, and compassion. This was character-driven storytelling. This was really good writing. Nowadays, it's not like that. Nowadays, female characters are often written to be very masculine because that's what writers think makes them good characters. And there's really nothing else that seems to matter about their personality. So in the past, yes, we had masculinized characters like Vasquez or Sarah Connor, but at the same time, it was an era where femininity was still valued in cinema. Motherhood, feminine traits were still considered to be virtuous and a source of strength and power. For example, Ripley had a strong maternal bond with the character of Newt. Nowadays, depictions of femininity seem to only be skin deep or cosmetic, like in Charlie's Angels or the new Bond movie, where the women may may be wearing dresses and makeup, but it's just superficial. The writers only seem to place true value on these women behaving like tough action oriented badasses who are basically like male archetypes, but cast with female actors. So you've got superheroes in fantasy worlds with preternatural strength. They've got, you know, magic going on. Maybe there's aliens or vampires or whatever where the laws of physics and reality lend themselves to making these strong female characters possible and believable. And then you have these extraordinary human women like Sarah Connor and Ripley from Aliens. You have to cast a woman who can achieve a certain degree of upper body strength, I think, like Linda Hamilton did in Terminator 2, because someone like Natalia Reyes as Danny Ramos in Dark Fate, at 5'1", she's not believable. And she doesn't look particularly imposing when holding a gun. She looks like a child holding a gun. And yet we're expected to believe in Terminator Dark Fate that she's going to one day become this incredible strong military leader in the future. It doesn't work for the same reason that Amelia Clark didn't work as Sarah Connor in Terminator Genesis. It takes a special kind of actress to pull this kind of thing off. Now also look at the new Charlie's Angels film. This is where it also becomes increasingly difficult to suspend disbelief. Now, the first two films were effectively silly, spoof, campy movies, and they were ridiculous. And that's part of how they kind of worked to a degree, although I'd argue that they're really bad films. But anyway, the recent 2019 film, uh, you have women in heels and dresses beating up guys who are way taller and larger. And they're doing these extraordinary action scenes with ease and they make everything look effortless, and it's all done for feminist female empowerment as opposed to serving the story. So if you look at the trailer for the new Bond movie, No Time to Die, you know, generally this film looks like another generic modern Bond film. Does anyone still care about this franchise? <laughs> There's a couple of moments that are reflective of our modern woke cinema. So the first is Lashana Lynch's character, who has to put Bond in his place right away. Because the world has moved on, Commander Bond. The world's moved on, Commander Bond. You were double O. Two years. We're not stuck in the patriarchal past now. We have female double O's. So stay in your lane. You get in my way. I will put a bullet in your knee. Don't you know that women are now physically as strong as men? There's no such thing as Bond girls anymore. It's Bond people now, I guess. Whatever. <laughs> They write these obnoxious female characters that are expected to be strong female characters, right? But they just talk down to men and insult them, right? Trying to put them in their place. So you have this new character. She's a new double O agent. She's been an agent for two years. And she's speaking to James Bond in this incredibly insulting way. She's threatening him. She's threatening to shoot him in the knee, the one that works, she says. 
right? She's speaking to a living legend. But you got to put Bond in his place because he's a man, right? It's just incredible. She doesn't exactly uh, ingratiate herself to the audience off the bat. Does anyone seriously think that Lashana Lynch is a physical match for Daniel Craig? So later in the trailer, you have this female character who, just like the characters in Charlie's Angels, you know, she's in a dress and heels and makeup. And, you know, this is supposed to be James Bond, right? This is supposed to be grounded in something related to reality, right? There's no superpowers in this universe. This isn't Underworld or the MCU, but here she is, shooting two guns at the same time. One is a bit larger than the other one. There's no real kickback to speak of. She's able to hold these weapons in the air and fire them, and presumably she hits her target, despite the fact that at best, she can only be aiming the gun in her left hand because her right eye is covered by her hair. <laughs> Who is believing this? Seriously. And then we have my favorite part. She does a spinning kick in the air. She's all glammed up with her dress and she's still wearing heels and she kicks a guy away and then falls to the ground. It's just, it's too much. Okay, I get it when it's Buffy. I buy into it a little bit when it's a superhero or something. But we're talking about a non-sci-fi universe here. Look, I get it. It's all fiction. They're just movies. But I'm not trying to nitpick here. But the suspension of disbelief is becoming increasingly difficult in Hollywood action movies these days, where we're supposed to accept equality of physical strength between men and women, regardless of massive size and muscle mass disparities. And it's largely because of the female empowerment feminist agenda, and it's becoming increasingly cringy and absurd. As I said, it works in a sci-fi fantasy context. If there's some kind of magical MacGuffin or mystical superpower justification, but we're talking about regular petite women beating up massive tanks of men with ease and throwing them around a room. It's just insulting to the intelligence. 